These are the official languages of India. There have been hundreds of languages that have existed in the subcontinent for millennia. The most widely spoken and common language families in India are the Indo-Aryan and the Dravidian. But there are also Tibeto-Burman and other unrelated languages that are spoken by smaller groups. The point is that India has hundreds of languages and thousands of dialects. So how does one country end up with this many languages and dialects? That is the important question. And to answer that, we have to travel back a couple thousand years to a point in history where literature as we know it is just about beginning in India. At this time, people groups in the subcontinent are starting to transform their lifestyles from a semi-nomadic to settled agriculture. Like humans anywhere in the world, these people, or at least the intellectual class, are not just thinking about the immediate issues of society, but often also about larger questions of existence, the universe, ideas about the meaning of life, and so on. They often debate and discuss philosophical ideas and attempt to answer some of their own questions, but remember, this is a long long time ago. And without the existence of a written script, these ideas, debates, and discussions are all passed down orally. In the northern half of the subcontinent, Sanskrit is the literary language. Vedic Sanskrit, to be precise, happens to be one of the oldest languages in the world. It is the language of the Vedas, hence Vedic Sanskrit. Without the existence of a script for the language, the Vedas actually began as an oral tradition at least about 3500 years ago. There are four Vedas and they talk about various deities, hymns, mantras, rituals, and religious and philosophical discussions. They are the earliest religious texts in India, and in fact some of the earliest in the world. This Vedic period of history lasts for quite some time, but this period eventually comes to an end around the time when the Upanishads are composed. The Upanishads are basically the concluding part of the Vedas, dated back to roughly 2500 years ago. Hence, they're also known as the Vedanta, or the end of the Vedas. There are 108 of them, and they go beyond just hymns, mantras, and rituals, and deal with ideas of meditation, philosophy, consciousness, and a bunch of other ontological knowledge. With the Vedas and now the Upanishads, there's a critical mass of literature that is starting to form the basis of later Hindu philosophy, and are essentially laying the foundation of the Indic civilization. Note that the language of the Upanishads is still Sanskrit, and that's all happening in the north. But around the same time, in the south of the subcontinent, a Proto-Dravidian language was spoken which is now beginning to evolve into what scholars have categorized as Old Tamil, the first of the three periods in the evolution of Tamil. This is also a period where agriculture, metalworking, production of commodities, and trade are expanding rapidly as many small political units in various parts of the country consolidate into large kingdoms called the Mahajanpadas. It's precisely around this time that Vedic Sanskrit begins to transition from the primary language to a secondary language of religion and learning, marking the beginning of the classical age in India. During this time, as larger kingdoms and empires start to develop and trade, literature and arts flourish, there is a growing need for some standardization in language. So, a revered scholar and Sanskrit philologist of that time, Panini, not Panini, Panini, authors the first and one of the most important texts in linguistics called the Ashtadhyayi. This text also dates back to around the 5th century BCE. On one hand, Ashtadhyayi describes the Sanskrit language as it was used by the people at the time, but it also authoritatively prescribes correct and standardized grammar. Panini uses technical metalanguage, which consists of syntax, morphology, and lexicon, to create rules. The sophisticated logical rules, techniques, and algorithms used for generating well-formed words and sentences have been incredibly influential throughout the history of linguistics. Even though classical or Paninian Sanskrit is broadly similar to Vedic Sanskrit, it was still considered a separate variety and became a marker of social class and educational attainment. But you see, the way languages are spoken by common people is constantly evolving as time progresses. Words find new meaning, some words become obsolete, and some new words enter the lexicon. Given enough time, 
even grammar starts to deviate in unique ways in different parts of the subcontinent. The Sanskrit of the classical age evolves further into unique Prakrits in different parts of the country. Prakrit isn't a specific language, but rather a term meaning natural or ordinary. It was used to categorize vernacular or local languages of that time. Some scholars also emphasize the independent development of these languages, often separated from the history of Sanskrit, while others tend to differ from that view. Anyway, time moves on. The timeline is now moving past 500 BCE. This is a time when many kingdoms rise and fall, and India experiences tremendous economic and cultural growth in vast areas of the subcontinent. Soon enough, the various Prakrits get patronage from local kings and they don't just remain spoken languages, but become literary languages. The earliest surviving inscriptions in a Prakrit dialect called Pali are from Emperor Ashoka's rock edicts created during his reign between 268 and 232 BCE. Now let's go back to the south. 2300 years ago, some of the most important old Tamil inscriptions are found in caves in a variant of the Brahmi script called Tamil Brahmi. Between 300 BCE and 300 CE, that's between 2300 and 1700 years ago, with the majority of the work created from 100 CE to 250 CE, we see the emergence of Sangam literature also known as the poetry of the noble ones. It is probably the earliest body of literature in South India. What makes Sangam literature unique in ancient times is that it's mostly secular literature. It was written by around 473 poets who were from all kinds of backgrounds. Some came from royalty, some were businessmen, and some were farmers. What is fascinating is that at least 27 of the poets were women, not bad for that time. This literature has two main categories that can be divided in, Akam and Puram. Akam poetry talks about human emotions and sentiments in the context of romantic love, connection, and sensuality, while Puram poetry is focused on heroic achievements in the setting of battle and public life. Around 200 BCE is also when we start to see some of the first inscriptions in the Kannada language. The first written record is traced back to Emperor Ashoka's Brahmagiri Edict. The first full-length stone inscription with Brahmi characters is found roughly 600 years later in 450 CE, which indicates that Kannada had become an administrative language by this time. And then, by around 575 CE, the first inscriptions attributed to the Telugu Cholas and literature in the Telugu language begin to appear. This happens when the Cholas break from the practice of using Prakrit and begin writing royal proclamations in the local language. The Chalukya kings of Telangana also began using Telugu for their inscriptions. Meanwhile, Old Tamil has constantly been evolving, and by the 8th century CE, it completes its transition into Middle Tamil. Middle Tamil has a lot of inscriptions, and a huge body of religious and secular literature. This literature also includes songs and poems of some famous Bhakti poets. During this time, a dialect diverges from Middle Tamil in the southwestern region, which later becomes its own distinct language, called Malayalam. This divergence from Middle Tamil was the result of some influence from Sanskrit grammar and lexicon. From 600 CE onwards, Kannada goes through a lot of change. From 1400 to 1600 CE, at the peak of the mighty Vijayanagar Empire and the reign of King Krishnadevaraya, the language experiences growth in all its literary forms. With the support and patronage from the state, incredible works of literature are created during this time, and poet Kumar Vyasa even renders the epic Mahabharata in Kannada. It's also during this time that we see the origin of Dasa Sahitya. By now, Middle Tamil has evolved into Modern Tamil. So that explains the South. Back in the north, over the centuries, those Prakrits that I was mentioning eventually transform into Upper Brahmasas, which are believed to be used until the 13th century CE. The term Upper Brahmasa implies a non-standard or a corrupt language. It seems like the Sanskrit-speaking intellectual elites of that time had a hand in coining that term. But regardless of that, the various dialects of the different Prakrits continued to spread and flourish. Centuries come and go and the evolution of these languages continues. 
Eventually, after the 13th century CE, these upper Ramasas start evolving into the modern-day Indo-Aryan or Indic languages that we know of today, a lot of them which have their own unique scripts and a rich history of literature. These modern-day Indic languages are categorized in various groups, the Dardic, the Northern, Northwestern, Western, Central, Eastern, and Southern. A lot of these languages are widely spoken by tens if not hundreds of millions of people across the Indian subcontinent. So that explains the North and the South. A smaller family of Tibeto-Burman languages are spoken here. Languages like Manipuri, Tripuri, Bodo, Garo, and various groups of Naga languages. It's not easy to find a ton of information about these languages. But basically, Manipuri was the ancient court language of the Manipur kingdom until the kingdom was merged into India in 1949. It is the native tongue of the Métis people of Manipur, but it's also the lingua franca between all groups in Manipur. The present-day Manipuri evolved from old Manipuri. It has its own script, with the earliest known usage of the script being in the 6th century CE, which was found engraved in a coin of that time. The earliest known written record found in this language is a copper plate inscription dating back to the 8th century CE. This video is a pretty simplistic explanation of the evolution of languages. Like many other languages around the world, Indian languages have been influenced and have influenced each other as well as foreign languages in fascinating ways. That was a quick look into the history and evolution of Indian languages, why there are so many of them, and how we get this rupee note with these many languages on it. <laughs>